it's human nature to take risk. All of us take small risks. You get in your car to drive to work. Many of you probably got in a plane to get here. It's very Silicon Valley to have an adrenaline-pumping hobby on the weekend. That's a higher risk. And I feel like I should thank everybody, especially for taking the higher-than-average earthquake risk to come to our conference. But it's also in our nature to protect against loss. And we do this by sharing our risk or pooling. And this is not a new concept. In its most basic form, this has been going on for centuries. Farmers used to pool their crops at the end of the season. So they would choose to give up a higher-than-average yield in good years in order to mitigate loss in down years. And this is the fundamental concept behind insurance. And we're going to talk today about the brief history of insurance and its curious connection to coffee, the present day, and why creating an insurance company is so damn hard. But most excitingly, I'll look towards the future and how soon when you buy insurance is going to change, but also how you're pooled and how you're scored. So let's take a quick trip back a few hundred years. The first insurance market was actually a coffee shop. Edward Lloyd set up one of the first coffee stores in London on Tower Street by the port. And it was here that financiers and shipsmen used to meet to make some of the first insurance contracts. These contracts were bottom recontracts. Helmsmen would insure the contents of their ship before they went overseas. Another interesting history tidbit, this was also where the concept of underwriting was developed. Financiers used to write on a sheet of paper the level of risk they were willing to take on, and then they would sign underneath. Now, there was not a lot of sophistication to these early insurance contracts. No concept of how good is the shipsman, how sturdy is the ship, how dangerous is the route. That level of sophistication came significantly later. The first insurance fund, as we know it today, where we pay differentiated premiums into a pool, and then that pool is reinvested, was developed by a Scottish clergyman. And this clergyman was trying to solve the problem of widows and orphans becoming somewhat destitute after the clergy passed away. They often wouldn't have enough money for food, they would end up homeless, and so he turned to insurance to solve this problem. But first, he had to expound on two fundamental concepts. The first one is life expectancy tables. Now, this seems pretty obvious today, but rewind a few hundred years, and the UK government used to sell life annuities at the same price, whether you were 20 or whether you were 40. And so here's what this clergyman did. He dug through handwritten death certificates at the time for several decades prior and was able to determine, given a clergy of a certain age, how many more years were they going to live. The second concept is what is now just basic probability and statistics. Given a pool of clergymen, in any given year, how many widows and orphans were going to need to be supported. And it was here the first modern insurance company came to be. But still, the concept was not widespread. This, as you might have guessed it, took some calamities, specifically the London fire. This wiped out two-thirds of homes in the city. And this is where insurance really went from a nice-to-have to an absolute must-have. So what do insurance companies need to do beyond figuring out the risk? They need to manage claims. And here's where early companies were fairly creative. And you recognize some of these modern concepts today. First, companies would put metal placards on the doors of the homes that they insured with the name of their insurance company. You see these now still from AT&T with burglar alarms. Second, it makes sense that if your house is on fire, if you could put out the fire faster, then your claim is going to be less. So they spun up their own private insurance, uh, their private fire truck fleets. And this worked well for a while, but then there were these stories of a fire truck driving past house A that was burning in order to put out the fire in house B because it was insured by their company, whereas house A wasn't. So this obviously was not the most efficient way to have a fire truck service, and it's moved more to the model we know today, where we pay into a pool and the government runs the service. But this shows that the fundamental concepts behind insurance have been around for a very long time. What do insurance companies do? They acquire customers, like we saw at the coffee shop. They underwrite them, like we saw with the clergyman. And then they manage claims, like we saw with the fire trucks. And these concepts have developed, but have remained relatively, relatively the same. But this industry has grown tremendously. If I asked you all to guess the size of the insurance industry, you probably wouldn't get up to $5 trillion. This is the global industry. In the US alone, it's almost $1.5 trillion. Quick poll, and you could probably name five or six insurance companies, and that's because in the Fortune 500, one in 10 companies is an insurance company. 
And we've talked about all of us pooling our risk, but insurance companies also pool their risk. And this you probably read a lot about during uh, various like Hurricane Katrina, other large calamities. And it makes sense because if you are a company insuring something that's going to be that disastrous, you'd better hope that you've offloaded some of that risk to somebody else. And this is what happens. Insurance companies offload to reinsurance companies. Then this actually keeps going, that offload to retrocessionaires, and it spreads out even further across the private and even backstopped in some of the public markets. And that's mostly just the private sector. If we look at the public sector, and I, I love this quote, this is by the former, uh, former Undersecretary of the Treasury, Peter, and he stated that the, the government can be thought of as a giant insurance company with a sideline business in national defense and homeland security. And we think of medical insurance, social security, but the government is also behind lots of crop insurance, flood insurance, many other forms of insurance that are very fundamental to our society. So given the size of the industry, we would think that there's a continual stream of new entrants. Let's look at some of the brands that you would probably think of if I asked you to name an insurance company. Many of them have modern marketing messages. We talked about Flow from Progressive yesterday. These companies have all been around since before World War II. We heard from Berkshire about some of the partnerships going on, and so there's been large new entrants that have partnered to get into the industry. But in terms of a ground-up new entrance, this hasn't happened in over 80 years. Why, as some of you in the audience are firsthand familiar with, creating an insurance company is really difficult. So specifically, let's look at why. If you could name one thing in the, or one logo in the insurance company in the insurance world that you'd heard of, it's probably the Geico Gecko. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Why? Geico spends more than a billion dollars a year advertising to you. And they can do that. They're a very, very large company. But a new company that wants to end up at the top of the search list, if somebody types insurance into Google, is going to have to buy the most expensive keywords out there. We did some quick math, and apparently 50 million dollars of Google's or 50 billion dollars of Google's market cap can be attributed to insurance. Next, even if you can find customers, engagement in this category is extremely low. With the exception of health insurance, most of us, if we're lucky, don't have to think about insurance. We do this once, maybe twice a year. And so you can find customers, but finding customers at the point in time when they're going to buy insurance is very, very difficult. Lastly, customers that are looking for insurance are probably not the customers that you want. Think of the person that's lying awake at night wondering about how they're going to buy life insurance. That is the definition of adverse selection. And the challenges go on from there. Let's think about underwriting, developing a new risk scoring model in insurance and contrast that where there's also a lot, of, uh, a lot of new entrants in lending. If I want to figure out a better way to give a 90-day loan, here's what the new companies are doing. They raise a bunch of venture capital money, they attract customers, they lend to everybody. And this sounds like a terrible idea because inevitably they lose a bunch of money. But actually, it's a very good idea because for a relatively small amount of money and in a short period of time, something longer than 90 days, they've figured out who they can lend to, who they can not lend to, and they've, and they've uh, tuned their model. In most categories of insurance, the dollar volumes are higher and the feedback loops are a lot longer, and so you can't use the same technique. Next, regulation. No surprise, all financial services is regulated, but the special challenge with insurance is that there's no federal regulator. And so by definition, a new company has to go state by state by state, which just costs more time and takes more money. Lastly, with the exception of auto, most insurance is sold via a broker. Insurance is an industry where it's like, I've got a guy, and this is the person where you go when you get insurance from. And this is fine until you find you've got a new, a better product as a new company. And then you need to convince that guy that it's a better product, who's then going to convince your end customer that it's a better product. You keep getting, you get into this game of insurance telephone and the message could easily be lost. Well, with this bucket of cold water, I would not be up here today if I didn't believe that now is the time when this is really going to change. And insurance is going to become a much, much more exciting industry that maybe you'll even think about after this presentation. Why? We heard Alex talk about this, and this is really like we've moved to a world where, for the most part, I can whip out my phone, I can download any number of apps, and I can get pretty much anything on demand. The joke in San Francisco now is that the, uh, the tech companies have turned it into shut-in living for millennials. On demand is pervasive. Insurance is not quite there yet. And this is an admittedly obnoxious over-exaggeration, but the point is you really don't think of insurance as taking your phone out of your pocket, tapping a button, and getting insurance. And that doesn't even get into what the experience is when you go through claims. Next, let's look at risk. Risk is exploding. 
And this is not to pick on any company in particular. These are just some of the recent headlines. There's several new ones every week. It just shows that even the most sophisticated companies that have been around for a very, very long time are not immune. Nobody is immune. The level of risk has increased so much that it's really forcing the industry, both old players and new players, to react more quickly. But the most exciting force that's going on is kind of the converse of risk. Risk online is increasing the risk, but the online nature is also bringing to us more data. And the most exciting story in insurance is very much a data story. But like it or not, the internet knows pretty much everything about you. How does this tie into insurance? Auto insurance. What's the, what's the distance between your home and work? This used to be offline and self-reported. Now, Waze, Google Maps, any number of apps probably know it even better than you do. Then there's the opportunity for entirely new data sets. And this can be exciting or terrifying, depending on how good of an actor you are. I was very excited about this originally. And you probably remember some of these uh, dongles that came out. Automatic had one, Zuby had one. They were tiny dongles, hardware that you'd put in your OBD port. And I happily stuck mine in, drove around for a couple of weeks. And then I get this email at the end of two weeks, which, kid you not, said, Angela Strange, you are in the bottom 1% of drivers. I saved the screenshot. I was like, I would have to try to be worse than this. So now that we've looked at what an insurance company does, let's look at how new entrants are attacking this industry. Talk first to customer acquisition. And this, this is the most challenging. We said Geico has advertised this to you at the tune of more than a billion dollars a year. But what did Geico do before they had a billion dollars a year. GEICO stands for the Government Employees Insurance Corporation, and they targeted government employees. These were easier to find, therefore cheaper to acquire, and from this initial set, they expanded into the large company that they are today. Farmers Insurance targeted farmers. New entrants are taking this offline concept and bringing it online. Let's look at a couple of examples. When might somebody think about insurance? Starting a new business. There are 28 million small to medium businesses in the US that are all going to need general liability insurance, workers' comp insurance, a whole variety of other types of insurance. And this is what Next Insurance does. They target, if you search for insurance for yoga instructors, insurance for photographers, you probably will see Next come up at the top of the list. And this has two benefits. One, insurance for yoga instructors is significantly cheaper than just blanket insurance. And then two, they're capturing people at the point in time when they really have a high intent to buy. So this has turned into a very clever uh, acquisition strategy in insurance. Another example, by type of insurance. To laugh at San Francisco a little bit again, pets and exotic type pets, including pigs, have become a thing. Uh, hedgehogs also. If you buy a hedgehog, you might want insurance for your hedgehog. This seems a little bit ridiculous, but there are enough people looking for this admittedly fairly cheap search term because it seems obscure. But if you're able to aggregate this demand into one platform across a whole variety of different obscure types of insurance, you've got a rather large company. And this is where Bought by Many has started. They do hedgehogs and many, many other things that seem a little bit less ridiculous, but I had to put a cute picture up on the screen. So now we've acquired customers. Let's talk about underwriting them. If you have a home, you've probably filled out a form that looks something like this. It won't surprise you to learn that, on average, companies ask you 40 to 60 questions. And they go something like, when was your home built? Uh, how old is your roof? Have you had it fixed? What's the kind of material? Chances are you probably don't know the answers to those questions, and oftentimes just kind of guess, or you have to spend a lot of time looking it up. It's not that fun of an experience. It's also not that great an experience from the insurance company's point of view because it's very, very error prone. Now, with all of this data online, a company like Hippo can come in and they've aggregated dozens of different data sources and even brought in some new data sources, such as their underwriting for home insurance is not 40 questions, it's one question. What's your address? Much, much better experience. Another example, commercial property insurance. Wouldn't surprise you to learn that the bulk of claims in commercial property have to do with the roof. It's so expensive, in fact, that a lot of insurers will send a person out to the roof to check it out. And there's a little bit of an irony here because they need insurance on the person to go check out the roof so that they can issue insurance. Better view takes satellite data, uh, sometimes augments with drone data, so it gets a better picture of the roof and in many cases can also obviate the need to send out a physical person. So that's existing data with some augmentation. The really interesting thing going on in underwriting is companies that are capturing entirely new sets of data. And this is really difficult for a few reasons. First, how do you get this data? So I saw probably a few of you in the gym this morning, and I'll ask, what do healthy people like even more than being healthy? Bragging about being healthy. 
bonus, and you know some of you guys do this, bragging about it in a quantitative way. There's an entire set of apps that do this. And this is what Health IQ has really, really captured. They target specific health-conscious verticals. Uh, are you a vegan? Are you a runner? Are you a weightlifter? And then they ask specific questions in a time frame that is short enough such that they can ensure the fidelity of the data. Are you a weightlifter? How much does the weightlifting bar weigh? Are you a vegan? What's one fruit that strict vegans won't eat? Figs, by the way. I actually had no idea before we invested in this company. Then, what Health IQ does is they've had millions of people that have filled out this quiz. And this is where this gets just a little bit morbid. People who fill out the quiz, it's attached to your Facebook profile. And when you die on Facebook, your status is flipped to remembering. So now Health IQ has millions of people that have filled out the quiz, a statistically significant number of people who have died, and they've been able to go to the reinsurers and prove that they, their population of health-conscious people dies at a much lower rate and therefore should have much lower life insurance premiums. Let's talk a little bit more about pooling. There's an inherent unfairness in the industry, in the insurance industry, and that is people with good behavior are paying higher premiums than people with bad behavior. If we come back to my bottom 1% of driving, any of you that are in my risk pool are paying much higher premiums than you should because I'm speeding down the 280. The challenge with this is that until new data sets really take off, it can be very difficult to tell who's going to have good behavior and who's going to have bad behavior. How do you pool better behavior? One example is you could do it by groups that are known to just have better behavior. For instance, um, teetotalers, the Mormons, anyone who doesn't drink should all be in the same auto insurance pool. The chances of a DUI are effectively zero. New entrants are trying to bring this concept online. I know which of my friends are probably going to take better care of their positions. And this is what friend insurance leverages. They do things like bike insurance and other categories. And if I invite 10 of my conscientious friends into my risk pool, at the end of the year, if we've had no claims, the insurance company will share that profit back with me. It's a win-win. I get lower claims, they have fewer claims. So we expect to see more and more entrants that figure out how to bring better behavior into the same pools. Now, many consumers don't think about insurance. Businesses most definitely think about insurance. We saw some of the headlines uh, that went on with risk and all the cyber attacks. What some might surprise you to learn, though, is that two-thirds of cyber attacks are on small to medium-sized businesses. And this is especially challenging because these businesses don't have sophisticated risk teams, and they mostly don't know the benefits of cyber insurance. So here's where Coalition and Paladin have an interesting bundling strategy. They start with risk assessment and security tools that they give away for free. And this has a couple of advantages. One, small to medium-sized businesses generally are looking for security tools. And then two, after their prospective customers adopt these tools that do things like fix weak passwords, patch software, sometimes help employees recognize phishing attacks, they've lowered the risk of the small business to whom they're issuing an insurance policy. So this is just a very clever bundling of using a totally different product as a loss leader in order to gain insurance penetration. So with all of this new data, you would expect that insurance would open up more widely to more markets and more people. And that's exactly what's happening. Crop insurance in the US, it's a cornerstone of the farm policy. It's very, very much a staple. And if you think of one group that needs insurance the most, it's probably farmers. Think of your entire livelihood depended on the output of a season. And your level of control was so low such that pests, natural disasters, any number of other things could completely wipe out your revenue. You don't have to go very far afar into many, many other countries in the world such that by some estimates, 500 million farmers don't have crop insurance. Why is this? It's both a distribution problem and an underwriting problem. And here now, we are seeing several new entrants that are trying to solve this fundamental problem to many, many people's livelihoods. First, distribution. They start with a very simple message. We'll pay you when it doesn't rain. This starts to spread in communities by word of mouth. Second, underwriting. Low orbital satellite data and many other new agriculture data sets provide significant enough data so that world cover can tell down to the square meter exactly how much rain has occurred in various different communities. And at the end of the season, 
they're able to pay out farmers directly whose farms fell below that rain threshold. So this is a very exciting opportunity of insurance coming to the people that need it most where they haven't had it before. All right, so we've looked at acquisition, we've looked at underwriting, let's talk about claims. Now beyond the unfairness of you paying more than I do for my bad behavior, insurance also has a really challenging psychology behind it. And it goes something like this. All of us pay premiums to an insurance company. And for the most part, we don't make claims. But when we do, we have this feeling that we've been paying it to this company for ages, and so we should try and get the most out of it. And so it's a natural human tendency to just try and embellish that claim a little bit. Then from the insurance point of view, there's a conflict there too, because every dollar that they pay to you in premium, in, in uh, claims, is one fewer dollars out of their profit. Anybody who's actually gone through the claims process is probably feeling that tension. It is not a great consumer experience. So here's where a company like Lemonade is trying to solve that. Lemonade collects premiums like every other insurance company. It takes a fixed percentage of those premiums, puts them aside, and that's Lemonade's profit. Then the rest of the money is going to go towards claims. But versus most other insurance companies, they do an interesting form of pooling. When you sign up for Lemonade, they ask you, what's a charity that you really care passionately about? and users are then pooled by those charities, such that now, when someone thinks about making a claim, instead of embellishing it and stealing from faceless insurance company, they'd be taking money out of the Red Cross's profit. It's a very interesting way to help align the psychology. And uh, the other interesting trend that's going on here, and Lemonade is one of these examples, is a lot of companies are bringing behavioral psychologists as advisors and investors into their companies, because a big part of claims is just figuring out how to drive better behavior. But you can't solve all claims with better behavior. There's still going to be a lot of claims. And this is both a fraud problem and a process problem. Think first about fraud. Tens of thousands of claims across a variety of different geographies. If you've got auto, you've got different makes and models. It can be near impossible with the naked eye to tell exactly how much a claim should cost in various different geographies. And then that doesn't even get into more sophisticated fraud type rings. And here's where companies like Shift Technologies come in. They'll partner with probably many of the insurance companies in this room suck in all of your claims data, self-reported data, millions of different pictures, and run fairly sophisticated ML algorithms on top of them, and such that they can figure out which claims are anomalous and flag these for human review. Next, processing. This is just such a high volume industry that the temptation is to try and automate more and more and more. But here's what happens. Let's say claims under $500, I decide they're just not really worth the human effort into reviewing them and I decide to automate everything under $500. Very quickly, fraudsters will figure out that that's the threshold, and you'll start seeing a spike in claims for $499. This is where Shift has been clever in first tackling fraud, and now they are moving into claims automation such that they can help solve this problem. So we've looked at acquisition, underwriting, claims. We're at a venture capital firm. Let's bring this all back to an investment thesis and the types of companies that we're excited to look at. First, acquisition talked about how it's so expensive, in insurance especially, to get customers. So new entrants that don't have tons and tons of capital have got to have a clever wedge into the strategy. They can do this via niche groups, like we saw with Next Insurance, or some way of generating like a positive selection bias and attracting the customers that you want, like we saw with Health IQ. Underwriting. Now, with all of the data online, there's a lot of opportunity to completely eliminate the need to ask users questions at all. Even more excitingly, lots of opportunity to generate new data sets that enable risk scoring at a much more granular level. Then claims. Incumbent companies, new companies, everybody is going to need a way to better manage fraud and better process claims. And new entrants here have the ability to be the picks and shovels across the industry, a very interesting platform type opportunity. So where does this leave us as an industry? I expect to see more and more companies along these nature. I hope that we get, to fund, uh, we get to fund a lot of them. But if you look at the current state of the industry today, despite the fact that we've grown over 300 years since we started talking about the clergy, the experience is still generally, we ask you a bunch of questions, you wait a while, and then you get an insurance policy. I would say that although the industry has grown a lot, the innovation that we've seen over the last three centuries is not going to be nearly as exciting as what goes on in the next three decades. 
With consumer expectations, like risks just exploding, more and more data, what is this going to look like? First, insurance is going to become accessible to everyone and everything. But then even more excitingly, we're going to move to a world where risk is scored on a much, much more personal level. Such that the good news is that in the not-too-distant future, those of you law-abiding citizens that drive the speed limit down the highway are going to be paying a much lower premium than me. Thank you.